Hi everyone, my name is Do Kwan and I am uh, a co-founder and CEO of Terraform Labs. So at Terra, most of the work that we do is focused around usership of cryptocurrencies. So we are one of the organiza many organizations across the world that is looking to get cryptocurrencies widely adopted. Today, I'm going to be specifically focusing on what new features need to be built into cryptocurrency, like in order to get it to be more widely adopted across the world. I think everyone can agree that whereas, you know, every with with every passing year, adoption for crypto is get is getting better, um, mass adoption isn't here yet. So depending on who you're asking, the number of active Bitcoin addresses ranges from anywhere between seven to forty million. Whereas the number of active commercial banking accounts is about five billion or somewhere northwards of that. So given the thousand X difference, um, I think you know, I, we, we can all agree that there's definitely room for growth here. And now let's start to dig into the reasons why mass adoption hasn't happened yet. All types of monies, uh, including cryptocurrencies, is a type of product. And if you, if you view money as a product, it is actually quite simple with just two features. Number one, holding. So you, you can choose to hold your money in a bank account or you can you know, stake it in, in the case of staking coins. But in any case, like you can hold it or you can spend it. So you can use it to buy things or you can use it to facilitate specific types of transactions or to take on leverage. Uh, in, in any case, like at, at a sufficiently highly abstracted level, mass adoption will come when cryptocurrencies facilitate holding and spending better than fiat currencies can. So in, 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 in that sense, if we, if we build these two features to be better than what fiat can, uh, then we will have built a better version of money in a decentralized fashion. In terms of spending, crypto is already starting to prove uh, superior user experiences in terms of payments and settlements. Uh, in, so Terraform Labs, we operate two different payment companies, one in Korea and one in Mongolia. So in Korea, we launched Chai about a year ago, and today it's servicing about 1.7 million active users and is facilitating about a billion dollars in transaction volume run rate per year. In Mongolia, we have Mimi Pay, which is something that we launched about six months ago in, in consortium with the local partner. So that entity is doing about 30 to 40,000 monthly active users and is, is growing very quickly. So outside of our payment efforts, uh, there is also Coinbase Commerce in the United States that is widely integrated with the likes of Shopify, WooCommerce, uh, and then so on and so forth. I think, you know, cumulative volume for that payment service is around 300 million USD. We have Wirex Crypto.com that facilitates uh, the, the use case of creating debit cards that, are, that, that can be topped up in crypto. So there's, you know, millions of users that are using those different types of services. And there, there are pretty good reasons why users and merchants are adopting crypto-based payments over traditional uh, fiat payments. So number one, uh, this is quite obvious, is faster settlement times. The average settlement period that it takes a traditional payment gateway to settle is anywhere between 7 to 14 days. Um, and this settlement period is prohibitively long for lots of different payments use cases. So for example, for a ride hailing service, uh, you know, like a cab driver doesn't have the ability to wait seven days in order for his ride fare to be settled to him because he needs that money right away to be able to buy food and fu food for his family and fuel for the next day of operations. Same for, you know, lots of different, uh, 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 lo lots of different platforms that deal with, you know, food delivery or SMBs and restaurants because you, you working capital issues are uh, more significant. The, um, the, the smaller that the, the entities that you deal with day to day, -to -day basis uh, gets. And um, as you start to penetrate into markets that are outside of uh, the United States and Europe. Uh, compared to this, uh, Chai and MiniPay, for instance, is able to settle in six seconds, which is the average block time of the Terra blockchain. So uh, the, the working capital benefits that you can get from like a six second uh, payment service versus a 14 day payment service is obviously very large. Uh, second value proposition is perhaps easier to grasp, which is negligible fees. Whereas traditional payment processors charge anywhere between 2.5% uh, to 3.5% of the transaction value, 
in for lots of different cases in cryptocurrencies, you can charge a non-linear fee that is is quite trivial in in most cases. So uh, for significant types of transactions, uh, you are able to create cost structures that are fundamentally superior to what fiat settlements or fiat payments are able to offer uh, with these crypto payment services. We think that this trend will continue. Uh, we think that as core technologies, uh, you know, speed up and, and uh, lower the cost of transactions on, on blockchains, we think that the use cases for spending cryptocurrencies is going to keep getting better and better. I would say that on the holding side of things, uh, cryptocurrencies still has a pretty big problem in the sense that for the everyday user, it is still very difficult to hold Bitcoin. And by this, I don't mean that Bitcoin is not a good investment. It's It can be a good or even a great investment. But the simple fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the world's population are not don't, don't have the bandwidth or the resources to be able to invest with their paychecks. So um, for an everyday user that is planning to the very last time on how uh, his paycheck should be spent, you, you know, if the price of Bitcoin even falls, let's say 10% by the time that he gets his paycheck and before he has the time to liquidate it, it means that he has 10% less to spend on his bills, you know, for rent, uh, food for his family. So the cost of volatility there for the everyday user that is not looking to do price speculation is massively, massively high. Uh, so uh, in order for crypto to become widely ad adopted, you need to build features that offer principal protection in terms of the purchasing power of the user. And uh, today, the, the only answer there is stable points. So now uh, we have to ask ourselves, are stable coins uh, a good holding option for crypto? Well, yes and no. So yes, in the sense that it offers principal protection, but every time that you hold a stable coin, instead of holding a dollar in a bank account, you're, you're suffering opportunity cost of capital on the interest payments that you can get uh, by, by, by holding the money. So interest rates are pretty low right now, but if you hold USDC, Terra, or Tether, you get no interest. So in, in terms of that, like in terms of stable coins, we have a passive income problem whereby we have to come up with ways to compensate users for their opportunity cost of capital in order to cross uh, everyday users from uh, into holding uh, cryptocurrencies. So crypto needs to offer better passive income than fiat to be a better hold to the average user. And what I claim is that if we are able to create uh, yields that are sufficiently attractive, uh, users will will have no choice but to uh, cross over to uh, holding crypto. And the reason for this is, if you look at compound returns over a 10 year period for a savings account that offers 0.8% and then a smart contract that offers 8% annualized returns. For the former, uh, you get 108% of your capital after 10 years. So a mere 8% return for holding for 10 years. Whereas if you uh, compound at 8% per annum, you get 216% of your original capital. And given that a user's purchasing power uh, from a macroeconomic perspective is determined in relation to the purchasing power of the people around them, right? If all of your neighbors are doubling their capital every decade and then you're getting 8%, then in that case, it's suicidal for you to not switch over as well because the opportunity cost that you would have to suffer on an interest rate gap that is this large would be suicidal indeed. So obviously, you know, that's all uh, good. Now, I, I guess the money making question is how are you able to create uh, this type of interest rate that is both reliable and uh, and, and decentralized for the user. So that's essentially the money-making question. So uh, DeFi lending has provided an interesting part of the solution, right? So uh, we're talking about the likes of Compound, DYDX, uh, that you know allow users to trade uh, price exposure to assets in exchange for paying interest rates. So. Um, to illustrate how DeFi lending works, let me introduce you know two different people. So Bob, 
who is looking to get leverage exposure to Ether, and then Sally, who is looking to get passive income on her stable coins. So Bob is bullish on ETH, so he's looking to take out leverage. He takes out a compound loan to lock up his Ether and get a USCC loan at 75%, um, as at 75% LTV. And then he uses the USDC that he just borrowed to buy more ETH. So in, 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 in some case, by interacting with Compound, he's managed to increase his price exposure to Ether to, let's say, 150% of his existing capital. And if he did this recursively, like he could actually increase his exposure to many multiples from what he had before. So on the other side of the table, we have Sally, who's looking for passive income under USDC. She deposits USDC on Compound and loans out her coins to the many bobs uh, of the world that want the leverage. In return, she gets interest payments from Bob. If there are many bobs and there are Sally's, then the interest rate is high. If there aren't that many bobs uh, compared to their, that there are Sally's, then the interest rate is low. So everyone in this picture is happy. Bob gets his leverage and Sally gets even. The, the problem, though, is that the deposit yield on DeFi lending markets are too volatile. Very few bobs are willing to take out leverage for a long, sustained period of time uh, because leverage is risky and expensive. So it is only used when there's short-term catalyst for speculation. Um, so the, the interest rates uh, paid on DeFi lending protocols are powered by short-term speculation on underlying crypto prices which happens to be highly cyclical and volatile. So this is supported by historical data from Compound, which is the graph that you see here, uh, that where, where we see that the borrow capacity, i.e. borrowing demand for different types of coins like BAT or Ether is really high when ETH prices are rising quickly, i.e. there is incentive to speculate. And it's really low when prices are low or steady. So essentially, uh, you know, when, when there are reasons to believe that the price of Ether is going to go up very quickly in a short period of time, then people take out the leverage and then they don't in, 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 in other cases. So from a passive income perspective, this is a problem for Sally because she needs dependability in her savings and in, in her interest rates. If the deposit interest rate fluctuates wildly between zero to 8%, uh, you know, erring more towards the 0% end of the spectrum, then she can't compute the opportunity cost of her capital uh, uh, versus what the, the types of returns that she can get from a savings account or an IRA product. So in order to buy into this new smart contract savings system with confidence, uh, she needs to know that she's getting a fundamentally better deal than what she can get at Wells Fargo. So she, she needs predictability in terms of what, what interest rates that she can get from uh, smart contract protocols. Now, uh, we wouldn't be bringing up this problem if we didn't feel like there were features that could address, uh, you know, some of these issues. So we claim that, you know, a big part of the solution comes in the form of what we call liquid staking derivatives. So for those of you that don't know what liquid staking derivatives are, uh, let's let's just dive uh, do a quick background on what this is. So proof of stake consensus forces a user to stake their tokens into a blockchain which is to make them non-transferable for some period of time. So for the Terra blockchain, it's 21 days and subject them to sashing risk to enforce honesty about block validation. And, ret and in return for that, uh, people that choose to stake tokens get some sort of block reward, which is uh, a part of the token inflation or transaction fees that are made from you know, uh, various types of transactions that are being made in the network. Liquid staking derivatives are shadow tokens that has all of the facilities of staking, but are liquid and transferable among different users. So liquid staking derivatives are essentially shadow tokens that are backed one-to-one -to -one by staking positions, but at the same time uh, gets the cash flows from the underlying, uh, underlying stake position, but at the same time can also be transferred. So essentially, like you can think of them as vouchers that gives the holder ownership to the underlying staking position, uh, which, you know, by, and by using these derivatives uh, as a core primitive, you know, well, we can start to build the beginnings of what we, what we consider to be very dependable and reliable sources of passive income. So to solve crypto's passive income problem, today we're announcing Anchor. So what Anchor is, is that it's, it's essentially a savings account where stablecoin deposits are used to facilitate staking positions across 
multiple proof of stake blockchains. And the cash flows from the staking positions are used to fund passive income for depositors. Now, we believe that Anchor is an exciting opportunity to stabilize uh, you know, passive income sources for depositors because it taps into the block reward. And the reason why we think that the block reward must be the primary funder of passive income is because number one, uh, it's reliable. So Bob is flaky in short term, so he's only looking for speculation. Whereas the block rewards are funded by steady uh, and fixed schedule uh, token inflation and transaction fees. So mo most blockchains have you know, a fixed schedule by which uh, a certain percentage of the new, new tokens are minted to fund network security. And it's way more uh, steady than what you can get from uh, tapping into speculative leverage. And number two is scale. So the block reward is and must be the greatest and most reliable source of income on the blockchain. And this is because the network security of underlying blockchains should always be greater than the value of the assets that are securing. So in, in some sense, like if you are looking to, uh, you know, create sources of passive income, similar to the way that commercial banks tap to, you know, the, the greatest source of wealth uh, in fiat, which is, you know, the federal funds rates, uh, you know, controlled by, you know, central banking institutions in the US. Uh, in order to create passive income on the blockchain, you know, uh, we, we need to be tapping into the block reward, which is the greatest source of value generation uh, across, you know, proof of stake networks today. So uh, Anchor Yield is also powered not just by one, but by a diversified income stream of staking rewards from multiple different POS blockchains. So uh, it, from, from that sense, we can benefit from the diversification of those cash flows and offer uh, low volatile interest rates that are attractive on stablecoin deposits. So looking under the hood, Anchor relies very strongly on liquid staking derivatives. Uh, in, from a smart contract architecture perspective, Anchor looks quite similar to Compound. There is still a Sally making our deposits and Bob looking to take out loans. So the one key difference is that Bob collateralizes his loans with liquid staking derivatives. Uh, so um, so in, in, in some sense, these collateral positions accrue cash flows from the staking rewards that, that accrue to these derivatives. In the Anchor system, Bob doesn't have to pay any interest to Sally in order to maintain his loan. Staking rewards accruing to his collateral pays for Sally's interest, and then the rest is paid to him. As he doesn't have to pay any explicit interest rate, Bob is less concerned about winding down his loan, and he's able to take a much longer term perspective uh, in, in terms of uh, getting the loan. So the key difference of the anchor system is that given that the underlying assets are cash flow bearing, the resultant system is much more capital efficient than existing crypto lending markets where uh, the, 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 the collateral tokens don't bear any cash flow. So that's, that's one of the key differences. So we believe that anchor has potential to be the reference interest rate across the universal blockchains. Uh, Anchor will be running across the interchain from day one. We will start out with Luna, uh, Dot, and Atoms as the starting proof of stake assets. And we ultimately plan to integrate with all sufficiently liquid proof of stake assets over time, including Ether. Uh, uh, as described previously, Anchor is a diversified stream of cash flows from the best sources of yield on the blockchain. So the the resultant rate, right, which is the anchor rate, has the potential to be more stable than any one of these one rates. Today, we live in interesting times where unrestrained quantitative easing is wiping out passive income opportunities across the world. Uh, in most developed countries, interest rates have fallen below 1%. And uh, really, there's real opportunity to acquire you know, the, the millions of households looking for better sources of passive income that are not correlated with central banking uh, monetary policies. So what we're, what, what we're trying to create with Anchor is a stable and attractive interest rate that is decentralized. Uh, and we believe that such an interest rate has the potential to cross over millions of households looking for better, better savings experiences uh, across the entire world. 
we see Anchor being used in lots of different applications, such as retirement IRAs, uh, you know, vanilla household savings, uh, even fintech apps such as Venmo or Robinhood that are holding significant amounts of user balances, uh, crypto exchanges, um, you know, and long-term escrows such as in real estate where there happens to be money locked up for long periods of time. Starting off, in Korea specifically, uh, Chai will be one of the first services to adopt Anchor. So Chai already has millions of users, and through the Chai card has is, is ubiquitously ex accepted by every merchant in Korea. By weaving Anchor for savings and Chai for payments into a common user experience, we are able to provide better terms for holding and spending uh, in terms of Terra stable points that users can get through uh, the Korean one. In fact, through ubiquitous uh, spent, uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitous payments and a superior savings experience, you eliminate the reasons why a user needs to hold care of W at all. And I think by sort of closing the user's retail loop uh, on what they need from their money in both uh, payments and spending is the only real way to get user, uh, to, to get mass adoption in terms of cryptocurrencies. Okay, folks, so that's a wrap. Uh, I spoke about Anchor as a means to get you know, creates pure savings to get mass adoption for cryptocurrency. You can follow up with updates uh, for Anchor uh, at anchorprotocol.com and follow anchor underscore protocol on Twitter for, for more recent updates. All right, thank you so much.